If one was to come across someone with specific language disorder, would they be able to tell? Not immediately, probably. You need to get to know that person. No, not obviously, no, I don't think so. But I think you would soon become aware if they were struggling to kind of maybe co communicate with you or whatever. Yeah, no, I. I it's not not an obvious thing, no. What difficulties could these people have when trying to communicate? I think trying to get across what they want to say would be one of the major difficulties. Um, they may become anxious about it as well, which then has a bit more of an impact on them being able to express what they're trying to say because they're just becoming frustrated by it. Um... When in life would their condition be more of a problem and why would it be? A lot of the times it's going to be a bigger problem in general society. I mean I can imagine going to the shop trying to communicate with someone who doesn't have that time, who's, you know, oh, I just want to get through this bit of the job, not having the space to actually, you know, engage with the person who has the issue. A teacher is expected to be doing that, especially if they've then got all the information for special education needs about how they should, you know, um, help the students do that. So I can imagine it's just out in the general world is going to be the worst issue. Would they find it easier to communicate using online media, for example, Messenger? Possibly, I think older peers maybe. So you know, for the sh maybe students kind of like your age, because they would use Messenger, for example, so they might find it easier to talk to their friends in that way. But I think for younger children, it'd be tricky. Yeah, I think like Sam said, with older ones, you can take your time over things that you're writing, so you don't feel rushed, and you can um, think more about what word you want to use. Um, so hopefully it would take a little bit of the anxiety away from communicating because you're not always face to face with someone. Yeah. But like Sam said, with younger ones, that would be really, really tricky, wouldn't it? I think for social situations, it would be easier if you, know, if you were older because, like I say, you'd likely to use Messenger. Um, but yeah, for, for definitely for smaller children, trying to find the right words would be difficult, wouldn't it? So yeah, I think definitely easier for older peers but not so much for younger. How common is it for general people to mistake an SLD as someone who's just shy? No, I don't think, I'm, you know, in all honesty, on it, meeting the person for the first time, you would not necessarily, you wouldn't know the difference probably. If you, if you met them several times, then, then that would be, you might well then pick up on it. But I don't think initially, no. I think you may well think they're just shy. How would you be able to help them communicate more when they need to? It's the same as everything else. It's time. It's giving that extra time, that extra space. And I think the big thing is it's focusing on the ways we can deal with it, the ways that students can get around it, the way we as educators can can focus our shift. Um, I'm very minded of, of a quote, a lot of students keep coming back, if we judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree. And I forget the rest of the quote, but it's, that's, you know, it's, it's an Einstein quote, and it's that basic idea. Okay, what can we do to support, you know, to, to, to support the positives to the strengths that that student has. And I'd argue that's what we do all the time with, with the other more subtle things, because every student is slightly different, so we get them to play to their strengths. So if we're talking a, a specific, I don't know, educational issue or specific learning disability, whatever you want to call it, well actually, let's play on the strengths. And the major issue a lot of this stuff is if we focus on the negatives, focus on what people can't do, their confidence goes to, to just gets completely shot and it's, that's not good, that doesn't help anyone. 
What is the likelihood that an SLD is autistic? Is it a common occurrence? I think it can be sometimes, can't it? So um, sometimes young children, um, they can be quite forward with their language and then they can recess a little bit as well. Um, some people turn into sort of selective mutes as well and don't talk so, and they can sometimes be diagnosed with autism. So I think there is sometimes a link there, isn't there? But it's not always the case. Would they lie if it made it easier to answer certain statements to avoid talking? It's a, a first defence mechanism, but you know, it's, we see that across all students. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Did you understand that? Yeah. And it's, it's a basic defence mechanism. What I notice, it's very, very prevalent, certainly amongst um, autistic spectrum students. It's like, you know, it is the, 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 you know, it's almost like the stock answer. It's almost like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a learnt response. Are you okay? I'm fine. And I've seen that time and time again. Um, but yeah, I, no teacher should ever assume that someone is fine because they've just said they're fine. No teacher should ever assume anyone understands something because they said they've understood it. It's always, you know, give me something back. And I think quite often, I think the danger is, it's that little bit hard to dig deeper within someone either on the spectrum or someone with those specific speech and learning issues. And again, it's back to time. Does it just affect their speech or will it affect their understanding of other speeches? I don't think it would necessarily impact their understanding. I think people process things in a different way and it, it may do. I think on observation and just, but they may feel that because they can't quite express or give the response, because often in a class you're asked a question and then you're kind of under pressure to respond and you don't know quite how to respond or you're afraid to. I think the person who is struggling to respond may feel that the view of them is that the person who's asked the question thinks that you don't understand. And there's a danger of that, that, that there's a perception that if you can't give a kind of slick response or you struggle to give a response, that you haven't understood and I, I guess that that's not necessarily the case but it's often the perception when you're looking out on the class as it were. At what times would they find talking easier and what would be helping them? I think like we said earlier I think being with familiar people getting to know people would hopefully start to make people feel more, more comfortable um, in communicating. Um, I think to help them would be, again, sort of giving them time and allowing them time to process what you've said and then allow them time to kind of express what they want to say or, or give their answer. Um, yeah, so I think just sort of time and support really. Yeah. yeah, and whatever works sort of best for them as well. Everyone's sort of individual. So if they do, like we said earlier, like to write things down as well, then make sure that you've got some paper and a pen when you're trying to communicate to them as well. Final key points. Society needs to have much more of a holistic approach to, to people within that, their groups. It seems to me that, that people who are coming, say, into college with these language difficulties have often been kind of left out of the conversation, in a sense, ironically. I think, yeah, for us, it's more just about making sure that we get to know that person, what works best for them, um, and then we can support other staff with that to ensure that that student's always getting the right support. And, yeah, just to ensure that that student starts to feel comfortable and knows that they can talk to us and that there's never any pressure for them to be rushed or just, you know, just come up with what they want to say. It's, there's, there's always time and we're always here to kind of listen and just understand what everybody, or what students need from us, really. Yeah, they definitely, um, people with speech and language delays definitely communicate easier in a comfortable environment with people that they're familiar with and that they trust as well. Yeah. One of the big things that all students need is time 
to, you know, to talk to the teachers, to communicate with the teachers, to be helped by the teachers. It's, they need that time to kind of be comfortable, to relax into the work that they're doing. Just forcing someone down a path because you're limited in time, it's not going to be good for anyone. I think with special, um, with SPLD, with support issues, even more so, this is affecting you know, the future of students. We have all the time in the world Time enough for life to unfold All the precious things love has in store, we have all the love in the world, if that's all we have, you will find we need nothing more.